30 odd minutes is sponsored in part by Digital Dowsing. Who are you powered by? For the next 30 minutes, we will explore the unexplained. From mysteries beyond our galaxy to ghostly phenomena in our own backyard. We will dive into our psychic abilities and explore everything from conspiracies to the just plain weird. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. If the truth is out there, we will find it. But only by sheer accident. Hey! Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes of the Dead. (laughs) Check it out, folks. We have landed the mothership right inside the zombie apocalypse. There they are, coming up behind us. We're talking zombies tonight. Everyone's favorite subject. There's so much to cover. When you start thinking about this, it's a very big deal. And I'm not alone in my quest. Of course, on the mothership with me, have to say hello to Andrew Lake and Matt Moniz. Gentlemen. How's it going, Jeff? How are things in the con? Pretty good, pretty good. Excellent. We, uh, you, you really put us down a little too close to the zombie apocalypse. I don't know if you looked out the window, but... It's, ah, cowboy it's, up. It's, it's bad out there. Are you guys ready for the oh. yes. <laughs> Wait a minute. All set there, Jeff. All set. Let me just make a quick observation. We're in a spaceship that, costs, that just can cross time and space. Can't we do better than that? Don't we have, like, lasers or something? Energy weapons are for sissies. Really? You, you like the feel of the old... Yeah, nothing like, right. nothing like black powder. All right. Well, I'm sure those things are outlawed in 49 states, and this is at least one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right, so we're ready. Um, this is a, an amazing topic. Anyone to say hello to? Andrew. Oh. Do you uh, have anything in the printer there, Matt? Matt. Actually, we do. All right. Uh, greetings to... Uh, Vlastosta State University Television in Georgia. The 30 yard crew hopes to land the mothership near your next kegger. Call us. Yeah. All right. Great. That's, that's kind of cool. There's actually a few uh, colleges and universities that play our show each week. Thank you, guys. I, I like to think that maybe some of you are turning this into some kind of drinking game. Perhaps every time we reference the mothership or use a preposition. Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I don't know. All right, so zombie apocalypse, we of course had to ask our own Dr. Dreck what he thought. Here's what he had to say. Greetings, oddballs. Dr. Dreck here. Uh, I'm going to be turning my segment over tonight for a very special public announcement. Hello, I'm Conrad J. Cadaver, and I'm the president of the Save the Zombies Association. Every night, thousands of zombies roam the countryside with no hope of nourishment. Oh, sure, the occasional senior citizen who can't run too fast, but most people have shotguns, axes, and baseball bats to discourage our poor, hungry brethren. They need your help. When you see a zombie coming, don't run away. Hold your ground. Throw away those weapons. They're so undignified. Welcome the zombie into your heart, and even better, your brains. Even if you can't find the time to help in a personal way, Save the Zombies is now accepting brains and body parts to be dropped off at our various local shelters. Look for the sign with a blinking bloody eyeball. Drive by and throw your bag of donations at the door and speed away, if you must. The Zombies will never forget you. And don't forget, the way to a zombie's heart is through his stomach. Thank you, Dr. Dreck. All right, so the zombie apocalypse is here. Are you ready? Sure, you know to aim for their heads, but how do you think the undead feel? Do they feel? In tonight's mission, we're going to discuss zombies and explore the tough questions like, what constitutes life? What constitutes death? And what constitutes undead? Our guest is a former homicide detective who has compiled a comprehensive and concise manual to explain the physical and mental challenges faced by the undead. His book is called Zombie uh, Advocacy. He's a career law enforcement officer who served in the U.S. Army, Navy, and Air Force, and tonight he's here to save us not only from the undead, but from ourselves. Please welcome live from Austin, Texas, Greg Lawson. Yeah! Greg, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being so well armed. We can see uh, behind you, we've got a lot of guns here. You've got guns there. I think we're covered. Tell us, what is it like being a zombie advocate? What do you do? I get, I get a lot of satisfaction out of it. Um, it it's, it's fairly rare that anybody wants to help out uh, somebody who's suffering from this particular debilitating condition. 
Uh, and in, in these cases, um, I'm, I'm just there to ensure that they get a fair shake as far as uh, you know their rights are, are being maintained. Okay, now we're going to show a commercial from your organization, the Undead Survivor Advocacy Project Z. Uh, we're going to see a commercial and then we're going to talk about it. Take a look. We often don't know the right time to discuss making difficult arrangements for ourselves or our loved ones. If you or a loved one has been bitten, time is of the essence. Notify the Undead Survivor Advocacy Network now. Our staff of professional advocates will respond quickly to assist you in making informed and responsible decisions about your future and the future of your family. There's no other organization with more experience in handling AMV sufferers. Call us now or go to www.zombieadvocacy.com and protect your way of life and your property, or what's left of it. The Undead Survivor Advocacy Project will walk you through every step of your future. Okay, zombies are on everyone's mind today. Certainly between the television shows, the popularity of the subject, people are buying insurance, the government's, uh, of, of course, uh, running experiments and, and preparing. How many people are coming to you saying, I, I need help, I need help and compassion for these, uh, these monsters? Is this, is this a movement or is this uh, one crazy guy in Texas? Pretty much I have dozens of them weekly. Get out of here. Dozens? That's 12 plus. Yeah, it, 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 in some in some cases, I feel very overwhelmed. Uh, the point that uh, uh, my staff, I pretty much had to automate, um, and uh, and yeah, um, but but we're we're handling. All right. So a zombie's coming straight for you. You've got your guns. You're armed. You're ready. Do you shoot him? In, in most cases, uh, you know, a, a lot of the people that are suffering from this uh, disease um, are, are moving pretty slow. So. You know, if you got a chair or something in front of you, you can step on the other side of the table. You can go outside. You can close the door. You know, and, and you can notify either the Undead Survivor Advocacy Project or call 911 and have law enforcement come. Right. Uh, in some cases, depending on what kind of training the uh, the officers that are responding have had, um, you know, what you're going to get. They might put them down right there, or they might notify us, depending on whether they know about us or not. So this this starts a bigger discussion. Do the undead have rights? And what constitutes death? What constitutes life? As a police officer, let's go into regular police officer mode. You walk up on a dead body that's been killed in a homicide. Does that corpse have any rights? Absolutely it does. Um, just because you're deceased doesn't eliminate any rights that you have under the Constitution or under state law, federal law. Um, and and that's one of the things that people get very confused about. They think that just because somebody has a virus and an individual is acting irrationally, that their their rights have been taken away from them, and, and that's not the case. So what rights does a corpse have? You can't speak for yourself. You have no feelings. You, you know, what, what, what rights does that corpse on the ground, just murdered in a homicide, you know, have? Well, you have uh, the inalienable rights from the Constitution, and of course, whatever the state constitution, whatever state you're in, um, all of that has to be litigated through probate. Even though you're dead, you still have the same rights, and once you go to probate, then that probate judge will then uh, decide who gets what, what happens to your body, and that's what. All right, let's talk a little bit about zombies through history. They're, they're, they're all the rage now, but they're certainly not a new phenomenon. They've been around for a while. Um, what are some of the early references to an actual dead walking the earth, uh, you know, corpse kind of thing? Well, in, in uh, Samaria, Gilgamesh uh, was probably one of the first ones uh, that talks about uh, releasing the, the dead from the underworld and have the dead come up and eat the living. That's probably one of the the, the biggest ones from uh, from from history. And then, of course, recent history as far as just any of the Haitian type uh, uh, of zombie stories, and, and you know, you can go into whether you want to argue fiction, nonfiction, as far as Frankenstein and, and that sort of thing. There, there's uh, uh, plenty of history. Right. Uh, so Frankenstein, right? I mean, a reanimated corpse, Mary Shelley. She, the idea was to take these parts, put them back together, and a little electric shock, and you've got a, a creature. 
But does he feel? I mean, the, the book, Prometheus, Prometheus Unbound, uh, you know, explores all of that. And, and it asks some, some pretty deep questions that we've been asking ever since. You know, uh, what, what does it mean to be human? And I think that's what this topic of zombies really uh, asks of us. Now, if there was some kind of outbreak, um, it's, and it's happened before, the Black Plague in Europe, where people turned into animals in some cases. You know, someone started to sneeze and you were put on an island to die. Uh, other than, you know, so people didn't have to deal with it. Um, this kind of stuff has happened before in, in society. It's happened. Uh, the AIDS epidemic, you know, we, we've had leprosy. people... Leprosy. Leprosy, right. Thank you, Matt. I mean, we've had issues where something comes up and, and a, a certain group of people with a certain affliction are feared, um, sometimes killed or whatever. And, and you know, why, why do we keep coming back to this? Do you think exploring the topic of zombies kind of helps us prepare for, for the next pandemic, outbreak, or otherwise? A absolutely. You know, we, we're we told all kinds of things as we're growing up, and we're, we're, we're told certain ways to behave. Um, and, and, you know, we get more education out of watching TV than we do actual formal education in elementary, junior high, and, and high school. And so that inculcation of um, this particular topic, especially now, through TV, through the media, through um, through movies and documentaries and that sort of thing, of course, brings all that stuff to light. And, you know, you mentioned the Black Plague. And the interesting thing about that is, is it probably only affected uh, 30 to 40 percent of the whole population in Europe. Everyone else was going to work. <laughs> so when, when people talk about the, the zombie apocalypse, uh, it's my belief that through science and through proper tactics that we'll be able to manage this uh, very easily and we'll, we're going to be able to, to handle this and it's not going to be something that comes out of control. <laughs> Famous last words. Famous last words, says, says our crew uh, armed with guns. Matt and Andrew, let me ask you guys, what, what, at what point do you think you, you, you cease to have rights, uh, you know, if, if some kind of apocalyptic plague like this were to happen? Do you want to start with that one or me? I'll let you start. Alright, if you die and you're reanimated, and you have no compassion for other living things, and you selfishly just want to eat flesh and brains, you need to be put down. Right, and how do you put them down? Uh, crowbar to the head, uh, bayonet in the eye, uh, or just blow their brains out with a, uh, with a firearm. Always to the head. Matt, yeah. same question. Um, I would have to agree with Andrew. Once you have passed you know, the point where you're no longer you, then your rights as a uh, living being because if your autonomic systems are not functioning, in other words, your heart isn't beating, you're not breathing, your, your circulatory system is no longer functioning, you are dead. And at that point, as far as I'm concerned, if you're a threat by the laws known as the Castle Doctrine, if you're on my property and I consider you a threat, you're done. All right. Fair enough. But you guys are cold-blooded, I mean, admittedly so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, you know what? I get it, though. <laughs> but you're also dealing with something, Greg, that, uh, if we're to believe popular culture, can't be reasoned with. And like Matt and Andrew said, you know, lacks compassion and, and seemingly lacks intelligence. So if you're dealing with something with no compassion and no intelligence, why shouldn't we treat it as a tree or a rock or any other thing that uh, just needs to be dealt with, cleared away, or otherwise? I'm pretty sure you deal with uh, people every day that lack compassion and intelligence. That's true. Um, and you don't put them down. Uh, it, it, you know, you can have all kinds of opinions uh, about what you should do with these particular individuals. Uh, it doesn't change state law. It doesn't change federal law. It doesn't change the Constitution. There are certain mechanisms, there are certain civil remedies that are in, in effect that have to be processed. Um, and don't get me wrong, if there is an individual that is an immediate threat to you or your family or to somebody else that needs your support, uh, by all means, do whatever is necessary. Use the minimum amount of force in order to protect yourself and someone else. Right. Um, and, you know, a crowbar to the head might not be the minimum amount of force that you'll need. As I said before, most of them are slow movers. Um, if you get into some bridging uh, incidents where one zombie 
uh, bites another person, and that person turns and bites another person, and then bites another person. Around the sixth, seventh uh, bridging there, you get into a hypervigilant state, and those zombies are very, very dangerous. They move very fast. Uh, they're anaerobic, so they're going to outrun you. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying marry one, date one, hang out with one. If something's dangerous, defend yourself. All right, fair enough. Okay, one quick question, and we're going to take a break for the news in a second. Do animals have rights? Your dog, your cat, your, your horse on your, your property, do those animals have rights? Absolutely. Right, I mean, and, and if cruelty to animals, of course, is, is punishable. If, if, uh, if someone's beating an animal, uh, defenseless or otherwise, uh, it's, against, it's against our laws to do so. Um, so it, would it be fair to compare a zombie to, say, an animal, or is this a different thing? I don't know whether it's fair to compare them to an animal. Uh, you can certainly uh, compare them to, let's say, a very, very, very deranged mental patient. Okay. Uh, and, and when you look at that, you have to decide whether or not that individual actually has the capability to follow through with any violence that they have toward you. All right. And that, that, that's the rule. All right, Matt, Andrew, what well, say you? I, uh, I absolutely love my German short hair pointer, uh, Cody, but uh, Matt will back me up on this. He literally turned into a zombie when he smelled my homemade chili. Yeah. And we could not get that dog to stop attacking us for that chili. We had to lock him in a room. But, but you uh, didn't put him down. Did no, you? no, no, no. Like our guest said, Greg Loss, a minimum amount of force necessary. You're also dealing with what, what is a domesticated animal. I would consider a zombie a wild animal. You're dealing with a grizzly that's <laughs> looking to do some harm. Or versus, you know, the schnauzer down the street. Right. All I right. was able to cure the dog by letting him lick the bowl later. <laughs> <laughs> well, interesting. So just let the zombie lick your brain. Maybe that would be enough to, to tie him over. All right, we're going to take a quick break for the news, and we'll come back and talk zombies. What does it mean? All right, for this. A recent report claims that the United States military once had plans to detonate a nuclear weapon on the moon. The project came about in 1959 during the Cold War and was given the name A Study of Lunar Research Flights, or the much coo cooler title, Project A-119. Apparently the plan was to launch a rocket armed with an atomic bomb at the moon in order to intimidate the Soviet Union. There were some who believed that this would give a much needed boost to American morale after the Russians had successfully launched the world's first man-made satellite, Sputnik, in 1957. The plan was scrapped by the military when fears were raised as to what might happen here on Earth as the result of such an explosion. Interestingly enough, one of the scientists who studied the feasibility of this top secret project was a young Carl Sagan, who had not yet at this time come up with his catchphrase, billions and billions, as in billions and billions of pieces of the moon could come crashing down on the Earth. I'm Andrew Lake, and oddly enough, that's the news. Thank you, Andrew. Billions and billions of pieces. Billions of zombies if you let them go unchecked. Uh, Greg Lawson, do you think there's actual zombies around today? I mean, there's... Oh, my God. Look at that. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. That's just the Rolling Stones. Dear God. Oh, man. They don't look as good as they once did, do they? All right. Real zombies are around I, today. I'm pretty... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind of threw me off a little bit. A little <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that there are um, multiple zombies around. Wait a minute. Uh, and what classification of zombie they are, you know, I, I'm not real, real clear on. I know, I know we have uh, Republican and, uh, and Democratic zombies. We have voting zombies. We have shopping zombies and, and, and sort of thing. So, Whoa, look at that. Yeah. Look at that hey. handsome son of a gun. I clean up nice, don't I? You do. <laughs> Wait a minute. We have one of you, too. Look at that. Huh? I like the eyes. It's all in the eyes. You definitely look hungry. All right. Has anyone told you you look like the governor from uh, The Walking Dead? Uh, no. No one has ever told me that. Christopher Walken every once in a while. But, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sorry. We, we, we got to talking earlier, and uh, The Walking Dead, of course, came up. Okay, let's talk about consumerism real quick. George Romero, The Walking Dead, uh, 1978. That's a line in the sand I think we have to draw. This is, uh, you know, Dawn... Um, oh, sorry, that's the Dawn of the Dead. Uh, Dawn of the Dead, 1978. Um, this movie, which takes place in the mall, right? Um, we're, we're talking about, uh, uh, you, you know, it was a metaphor for consumerism that we're all just, you know, walking corpses, buying whatever is, is put out in front of us. And I think it's become, 
you know, every zombie movie since then is almost some kind of derivative uh, of Romero's work. And, and, you know, where is this going and why is it so popular now? It seems like we're in an age where consumerism is being pared down a little bit. People are moving back to cities. They're trying to do with less, uh, less income, less stuff. Um, but yet zombies are more prevalent than they've been ever uh, in human history. Uh, why is it today that we need these things around so much? I think that um, you know George Romero, any of his works, as far as any of that, the, the documentaries that he does, right. um, are some of the finest uh, out there. And I, I think it does reflect contemporary society in one way or another. Um, it, it, as far as needing it, I don't know whether it, it, it may be a need, it may be a primal need um, that that we are. Uh, from an age to where we were terrified for most of our life, or the human condition, uh, it, 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 through a survival mode, uh, we need fear. And when we start moving into safer environments and safer environments, there's something missing. And whether that's productive or not, I don't know, but I know it is something that's missing out of our psyche. So when more and more of this comes about, I think that it's something that's a primal need for us. And there's nothing scarier than something that's right in front of you. Right. Uh, you can make up an werewolf or whatever else you want to make up. And uh, it, it's a little bit hard to grasp, but there's dead people all around us. Right. No, of course. They can be very terrified. It, now, and this is one of the points we wanted to make. I know it sounds like you know fiction and we're having some fun with it, and we are having some fun with it, but uh, these issues come up every day. Uh, Doctor-assisted suicide it comes up on state ballots, you know, uh, Dr. Jack Kevorkian. What about the case of Terry Schiavo? That got the whole nation. Terry Schiavo, of course, uh, you know, being uh, kept alive by feeding tube, and eventually it was decided to pull the tube and, and basically let her starve to death. And it started a big national debate over what defines life. You know, lack of brainwave activity, a beating heart, what, you know, what does define a, a living person that, that has rights to you know, medical care and things like that. What, what do you think to find, I mean, you've, you've been diving into zombies now for years, and you know, being a police officer, you've, you've seen the best and worst in people. What to you is the definition of a, a living human being? Well, you, you have the, the basic definition as far as uh, the, the biological definition. Is the individual breathing? Is there a circ circulatory system that's, that's working? And are there cells? actually living um, and you know that that's easy enough to establish however what's the quality of life is this individual uh, in a vegeta vegetative state or are, are they just unable to move but can still see you and hear you and uh, and understand what you're saying you know it's a very very complex debatable uh, topic. right and I guess you know talking about zombies allows us to continue that debate in the realm of fiction and, and zombie apocalypses, but here's another question. You know, Rene Descartes, of course, said, I think, therefore I am, which is how, uh, how he defined a, a living sentient being. If, if thinking constitutes, a, a, you know, a sentient being, we're, we're mighty close already with artificial intelligence, and it's only going to get more so, um, you know, in coming years. At what point do these machines have certain, you know, unalienable rights like living people do? You know, we can all agree, well, a machine's just, just wires and plugs and things like that, but at what point does thinking mean you are a living creature? And if thinking means you're a living creature, does that mean a zombie is not? Take it, Greg. Take that. Huh? <laughs> that, is a, that is a great point. Um, I know for uh, uh, just, just through observations, obviously, uh, uh, zombies do think. I mean, they don't stand and bump into a wall and just keep bumping into a wall. They'll work their way to the door. They'll they'll walk through open portals. They'll look through windows. Um, you know they don't they don't just try to eat bricks. They actually try to eat things that are living. So it's it's obvious that they're they're thinking. Uh, that's that's not too debatable. Uh, you, you came up with something really a uh, really great observation because it has to be pretty soon. You know uh, companies like Google and some of the other uh, ones that are just gathering just so much information. There's got to be a computer out there somewhere that is on the cusp, is on the verge of saying, wow, I am somebody. I know who I am. I'm, I am here. And, and when that happens, that is going to be a huge debate. Um, and, 
and something that once again, just like the zombie question, is going to have to be litigated, and uh, and those that are in control are going to have to decide what what that uh, definition of life is. Matt, what's the definition of life? You're chomping at the bit. Go. Forty-two. No, that's the meaning of life. What's the definition of life? Oh, okay. Uh, definition of life. Well, it's something that uh, is. Uh, yeah. The, the, yeah, that is a yeah. tough one to define. I know. I, I can give you a biological definition, right. but what is life itself in total? A banging good party. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Odd fest, which is of course next week's episode. Uh, yeah. No. And you're right. And this is the question that we're asking. You know, it started when we talked about doing this this subject. We just said, "Oh, zombies. That's fun. They're popular." And then you start thinking a little bit, and you go down the rabbit hole, and you say, oh, my gosh, wait a minute. There's big implications here. There's defining life and death. And, and what happens to humanity? That's why we love shows like The Walking Dead and why we love movies like 28 Days Later. And, and of course, you know, what, what, guys, what are your, let's go around the table here. Uh, Greg, we'll start with you. Favorite zombie movie ever? Excuse me, documentary uh, ever? Uh, probably uh, the one I enjoy the most is probably Land of the Dead. Which one? I'm sorry? Land, of, Land the dead. of the Dead. Okay, Land I, of the Dead. I, I think I really, I really enjoy that. I, I don't think you can get much better than The Walking Dead. I think they've done an incredible job um, yeah. in reflection on that. Okay, Matt, Andrew, same question. Uh, my film, definitely Shaun of the Dead. Shaun of the Dead, of course. Wonderful. Great, great movie. Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead. All right. Well, you know, folks, we, uh, we asked the Twitterverse what they thought, and we had uh, this week's question of the week. So the question was, what are your plans for the zombie apocalypse? And this is what you all said. Trying to survive looks exhausting. Probably allow myself to be bitten. See what it's like from the zombie's point of view. Very nice, Tim. <laughs> Alex Young said, I think I'm just going to sip herbal tea while sitting in front of a fire and reading a good book. Maybe Fifty Shades of Grey. Well, that book gets around, doesn't it? Thank you, Alex. Amelia said, find Daryl and repopulate the earth. Might have to clear this with the fiancé first, however. Nice. <laughs> Walking Dead reference. Eric Fisher, our own Eric. I'm going to the Winchester. Have a pint and wait for the whole thing to blow over. Yeah. Shaun of the Dead. Love yeah. it. All right. And uh, Brandon said, hunt down people and eat their brains. I'm not very athletic, so I assume I'll be bit fairly quickly. Well, at least you're honest with yourself, Brandon. We appreciate it. Tweets of the week. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, email us at info at 30minutes.com because we love hearing from you guys. These subjects get kicked around and the whole point is to keep the discussion going. We only have 30 short minutes. The movies, they keep coming. The TV shows, they keep coming because we're exploring what happens to humanity. Let's talk a little bit about the living. What happens to a society when there's an outbreak like this, like the Black Plague, like AIDS, like the zombie apocalypse? What, what does it say about people? Uh, what will we come to when this happens? Well, it, it seems to me when uh, uh, people are put under pressure, there's a lot of those uh, that that really um, lose it. Uh, I, I've seen it plenty of times, and uh, they just come apart. The, the social norms are thrown out the window, uh, and uh, group think takes over. Right. And a lot of times that's what happens, especially with, uh, with the, the zombie question is, just because one person kills a zombie, it's like, okay, well, then if that's okay, so everybody starts killing them. And, uh, and that's something that, that's very troublesome because, once again, they're eliminating that whole factor of, is this individual a threat? And, you know, do I have legal means in order to protect myself? And, and, and what is the least amount of force that I'm going to use? And most people just bullet to the head, crowbar to the head. Um, right. That sort of thing. That's the first thing they come up with. Crowbar uh, to the head. I, it, Greg Lawson, mistake. we are out of time, my good man. Thank you for joining us. The name of the book is The Zombie Advocacy. Greg Lawson will have links to your website from ours. From all of us to all of you, stay safe and stay odd.